Ganesh R, founder and co-founder of Fireborn. Let's give a warm welcome to Ganesh. Let's go. Yeah, Ganesh. Uh, for our panelists, we are going to have uh, Hannes Hamels, all right? And of course, our old friends right here. Founder of our reinvest DAO. Okay, please be seated. And our uh, Mr. Tony Fu, all right? Founder and CEO of Novotel. And we are going to have Eugene Chong, founder and CEO of Pan Roach Studio. Eric Alexandra, Jetcoin founder, okay, Dynamic NFT creator. And of course, please be up on the stage as well. Thank you so much. Please be seated. Andy Lian, all right, Intergovernmental Blockchain Advisor. And last but not least, right here, we are going to have James Lee, CCO of Starry Neve. Please be seated. All right, so before we begin, and of course, this is going to be the time right here to join us for the last round of our roundtable discussion. And of course, yeah, for those who are willing on web right now, if you miss out the first one, second one, the third one, do not miss out the fourth ones right here. Um, right now, I'm going to pass the stage right here. And of course, going to conduct with our moderator, Ganesh. There you go. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really, really nice to see so many people out here who are curious to learn a bit more about the technology. Uh, we have some great speakers here to be talking about NFTs. So I'm just going to recap the topic a bit. We're going to be speaking about how NFT empower the creator economy in the Web3 era and fully stimulate the development and prosperity of the cultural industry. I'm Ganesh, CEO and co-founder of Fireborn, an analytics and growth company for Web3 games. I'll be your MC for, the, for, the, for this afternoon. I'm going to hear a few lines about the current speakers that we have, right? Oh, hi everyone. How's everyone doing today? Feeling a bit sleepy? No? Energized? Yeah, okay, that's the spirit. Um, hi, my name is Hannes. I am the founder of Reinvent DAO, which stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. So what we're doing is that we're building a collaborative asset pool ecosystem where you can tokenize best practice toolkits and frameworks from the consulting industry and make it accessible for the gig economy. Thank you, everyone. Hello, everyone. I'm Tony Fu. And I should point out that uh, there is a table uh, of my company. My company is nftchina.hk, a Hong Kong-based NFT marketplace. And uh, we just launched three months and have 300,000 registered users and the trading volume uh, increasing rapidly. And uh, we are a BRC20 based uh, NFT trading platform. Uh, me myself was the graduated from Peking University and have my master's degree and have seven years ex working experience in Web3 or crypto uh, area. Nice to meet you all. Thank you for having you here. Hi everyone, my name is Eugene Chung and I am a investor, a filmmaker, artist. Um, so my company Penrose, we do metaverse and VR related movies. So uh, our last film, Arden's Wake, starred Alicia Vikander, Academy Award winner. Uh, we were the first uh, 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 film, virtual reality film to win the Lion for Best VR at the Venice Film Festival. So I'm really interested in the uh, intersection of digital art as well as crypto. Uh, I'm Bitcoin class of 2013. So I've been in the industry about a decade, but I'm more of a hodler. I don't really trade a lot. So I was actually, you know, not much uh, in the way of NFTs. Like I, I was more of a late adopter when it came to NFTs, early adopter to crypto. Um, nowadays, I'm, uh, but then I started getting into it. And nowadays, I'm really excited actually about uh, Bitcoin ordinals and what that's doing. I think it's actually a really interesting debate. Since the block size debate from several years ago, it's actually really interesting that you know the maxi say get your JPEGs off my off my blockchain, uh, and the you know the other ones, the people who are doing the ordinals think it's a great way to use Bitcoin's block space. So I'm excited to talk about that or other things. I do a lot on Twitter. I, I participate in a lot of Twitter Spaces, some of the largest ones with you know millions of uh, uh, of listeners. Uh, you can actually find me on Twitter at uh, eyc. It's really simple, just eyc, the three letters. Um, and by the way, I'm a last minute addition, so you won't see me up here, but I, uh, from the United States, uh, and I just got into Singapore yesterday, so great to be here. Oh, yeah. 
Hello everyone, my name is Eric Alexander. I'm the founder of Jetcoin. We've been looking since 2014 a solution to crowdfund emerging talent in the space of entertainment and sports. And we discover uh, NFT technology by early day it was Counterparty and Colorcoin. It tried to be on Bitcoin, by the way, at that time, but it wasn't optimized as the orbital we had just mentioned. Today, we develop dynamic NFT, meaning if you look at NFT today, the IPFS image, we are fairly static with an unlockable reward. We built a platform which is a mix of a CMS on AWS and IPFS, where actually your NFT have a storyline for different uh, stream of uh, images, video, and content, who can be updated in real time. And we have some exciting development on B2B and on technology. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Andy, Andy Lian from Singapore. Um, usually, I'm known as a government advisor, so I give advice to Mongolia and a few other countries. One of the earlier folks who tell the government what is crypto, you know, what do you need to look at. Um, more recently, I wrote a book, you know, uh, last year, sold about 10,000 copies. Um, investor since 2013, doing a lot of Web3 related um, advisory and investment. I do give some of my time to uh, Bybit as an advisor. I look after uh, some of the giant sponsorship like Red Bull, BVB, and uh, lovely to meet everybody. Hey everyone, James from uh, Starinaved. Um, Starinaved actually is a uh, metaverse platform. So we try to combine uh, 3D uh, virtual space with uh, decentralized identities and also with a more uh, Web3 type incentive and uh, rewarding system. So our aim is to provide a uh, Web3 a gateway for uh, all the users to uh, onboard uh, Metaverse, where you can play, you can earn, you can socialize, and you can create. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction to everyone. Before we commence, uh, I'm just gonna start with two questions uh, that will help us structure the conversation that we're gonna have over here. And this for the audience. How many of you actually heard of NFTs? Can we have a show of hands, please? Gotcha. So that's like a 75% here. And how many of you own an NFT in the space? All right. Okay, so not a lot of people who own an NFT. So hopefully by this session, either you are fully convinced of owning one or you're never going to touch it again, right? So let's start cracking with the first question over here. The NFT market is flooded with all kinds of wonderful works. Is this phenomenon a manifestation of innovation or a signal of industry bubbles? Right, we, anyone could take it. Yeah. Uh, I, all right, I, so, sorry. What I've seen in the market since 2014 when I joined a bit later than you, like any innovation, there's always excitement and enthusiasm. When NFT come, I think people see it as an alternative way to make money. We saw all cultural movement from the day again led by the Bordet collection, Azuki and Clonex. So we saw collection and a new way actually to uh, create value for NFT, but it was really early stage. And I think people call it the bubble. I think it's normal, it's enthusiasm, it's new, it's innovation. I think the wave has a bit crashed. Today we see more interesting utilities, provenance, uh, certification. In our case, we do ownership, we do fractional fractionization of a real estate. We're opening a nightclub in uh, Makati, Manila, where 30% of the profit are distributed to the NFT holder. We do a fractional ownership of image rights of talents. We do a fraction ownership of a whiskey container being sold to a CEO. So today we see more and more commercial application and people are playing the technology with true utilities. And I think NFT can unlock much more than that. Do I let the other panelists to talk about it? I totally agree that the NFT industry is a very early stage. And uh, if we take a look at it by uh, value, uh, value regression theory, I think 90% of the NFTs worth nothing. But the bubble is a good thing. We should take advantage of the bubbles. So uh, it, it will make it uh, spread very fast. Yeah. And also we've seen interesting collection beyond like the board app, Azuki. Many celebrities have done NFT collection. We talk about superstar, Johnny Depp, Anthony Hopkins, Messi, Ronaldo, uh, Beckham, Shaq um, uh, O'Neal. And we see this collection have a bit of a hype at the beginning, but I think it's long-term hold. So I think really interesting, like you're a filmmaker. Personally, I used to be a filmmaker in advertising. To be able to have an NFT of a superstar that's something valuable, personally, that may have not value today in terms of speculation. Um, 
supplying to what um, Eric and Tony was actually saying, you asked the question to the audience, how many of you actually own an NFT? Can, I, can you put your hands up again? I just want to get into some numbers. How many of you own an NFT? And are they mostly from arts? Property? Arts? Property or arts? Mostly digital arts? Games? Okay. So I want to take a step back a little bit and just explain what is NFT? Yeah? Non-fungible token. So the question that um, Ganesh was asking, whether does NFT actually have, um, are we in a manifestation of bubble? Or we are, is it, is it bringing a real use case to the economy? So NFT is actually as a form of ownership, um, a type of token, yeah? In a Web3, the difference between Web3 and Web2, Web2 is about read and write what you see on your mobile app and everything. While in Web3, NFT is a form of token that provides you ownership of the digital asset. So that digital asset can be in a form of arts, um, games, you know, education, content, but you put it on a blockchain. That's why we call it non-fungible token. So but related to this, that's why I personally feel in 2021, we've had the NFT summer where, you know, we had all the bot apes, all the crypto punks, all the digital arts, um, NFTs were on bubble, were on hype. But now you started seeing real use case of NFTs are actually being developed. Things like um, property, fractionalized ownership of a property, tokenization of bonds or tokenization of everything, we've got um, content, materials. So these are using real world assets that you are putting it on a blockchain that makes it transparent, imitable, and people can also see the value of the asset of the NFT. So I hope that helps to explain to those who do not understand what NFT is. Sure. Um, judging at the number of hands, you know, if we talk about NFTs as a form of securities, for example, mm -hmm. then I tell you there's no liquidity. The number of hands is just too weak. Nobody's going to buy your, your property and so forth. I, I, I want to take the stand of uh, what, what Tony has mentioned about the bubble. Um, to be very honest, you know, whether NFT has a utility or not, it is really very subjective. Because if you are a crypto native, you know, you love the project. You know, one of my friends, you know, the, uh, is a Waza X uh, co-founder. He, he mentioned what, what, what is an NFT. It's actually a symbol of love, you know, from, from a Web3 native to tell you that, hey, I, I, I deserve to be recognized. It is a status, right? So if you look at it from that standpoint, there's actually a lot of different views. You can actually give it to different people. You can actually try to use it as a tool to dr draw people to Web3. Then with, with that kind of Web3 audience, a lot of other things can start to, to grow a lot better. You know, then, then taking my, my friend uh, uh, Alex, uh, uh, Eric's example, you know, for, for all this superstar that is coming on board, you know, uh, we, we, we work directly with Red Bull, for example, you know, or, or we work directly with uh, some of the other uh, soccer players, for example. Many of these NFTs, to be very honest, they are not selling it for big money. You know, they are in fact giving it away. They are trying their very best to draw user, create user stickiness. I think that, that there's always a progression right now. And, and, and this is what I see, you know. I actually think most uh, NFTs are pretty useless, as uh, some people have, have brought up here. Um, you know, I love crypto. I think it's great. I think NFTs have a long-term uh, possibility to create user value, but right now they're mostly useless. Let's let's be let's be frank. But there are a few that have been very useful. Um, I would say that like usability is something that the prior speaker brought up, and um, I would say like one of the ones that were used a lot is actually Axie Infinity's like um, you know basically their the uh, basically their uh, game. Which, you know, if you look at SLP, Smooth Love Potion, it's obviously gone down a lot and, you know, the game is not as profitable anymore. But 
a game developed out of Vietnam, used in Southeast Asia, right? We're in Southeast Asia now. I mean, mostly it was like people in the Philippines making, you know, seven, eight dollars a day. I remember when I first played it, uh, I made like eight bucks, you know, of SLP worth uh, at the time in a day. And I'm like, hey, eight bucks, great. I can go get a coffee and maybe get a coffee in uh, San Francisco, right? Maybe, probably not. Uh, but in, you know, in other countries, eight dollars a day can make you quit your call center job or whatever kind of job. And you can start there and sit there and play all day. So there's actually, there was real economic value. I don't know if it was good or bad. You can give, you can say whether it was gambling or not, but people actually found it useful, right? And I think, again, it's going to be about how useful it is, not like DGENs trying to figure out how do we just like, you know, pump something up and make a lot of money outside of like the blue chips, like Board Ape Yacht Club and other things about Yuga Labs, like Cyberpunk. Um, so, um, CryptoPunk. So basically, I, I, I worry about some of the issues that are going to plague NFTs, but I actually think it's going to be uh, great. I think what's happening with Bitcoin Ordinal is really interesting. They don't even use the word NFT specifically because they think it's a bad word. They call it digital artifact, right? So that's, I think, maybe a slightly better word. We'll see. Um, and actually, they're finding something that's really scarce, the block size, right? There's only going to be 21 million uh, Bitcoin in the world, and there's very specific scarcity around the block space, right? And um, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of issues with that because obviously fees on Bitcoin have grown, up, grown out a lot. But uh, I'm, I'm excited about what some of these things can do over time, even though most of the things are pretty meme-y in there. Uh, you know, th things like Pepe Coin and Pepe's on Bitcoin's blockchain, etc. But I'm excited for how it's going to develop. But right now, there's a lot of fraud, but also a lot of cool stuff. But, uh, I'd like to add something because you mentioned gaming. And I think the user case for NFT and gaming is perfect alignment. Because today, we talk play to run. If you play a game like Grand Theft Auto, you have to pay money to advance the level to be a fantastic player. But all of a sudden, if you can mint your avatar on a, as an NFT, your car, your weapon, you can rent it and resell it. And that's a real play to earn user case with NFT and gaming. And I think these two uh, communities are super aligned. True, true. Sorry, I think those are really valuable feedback. Um, I'm going to extend the question from the audience point of view, right? So a lot of people don't have an NFT right now. How should they look at the NFT market right now? And which is the sector of the NFT space they should be looking at to buy their first NFT? If you don't have any NFT today, that's all you should think. Do you wish you knew Bitcoin in 2011? That's the question you ask yourself. That's it. Okay. Um, my advice is that like any assets that you want to buy, make sure you fall in love with it first. My advice is to follow the trend. For example, uh, recently we released an NFT program. Uh, it's a BTC Panda program. It is minted on the uh, Ordinal protocol. And Ordinal protocol is very increasingly uh, hot topic in the uh, crypto world. So yeah. it sells, uh, the, the, the floor price increases 10 times. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe a yeah. quick one, very, very quick one. I think. I think many of many of the audience here maybe do not even have a have a crypto wallet, right? So I think in order for you to really try it out, you know, go to some place where you can create a wallet easily, and then get some free NFTs, send it to your friends. I think that is a very baby step to look at it. I, I'm I'm not saying that NFTs are not for investment, but just look at it from a more fun perspective, you know. Then then you will enjoy the process a lot more, you know. Fantastic. I, I think that's definitely one way to look at it, right? Pick the interest level of where, um, what you support or what you like. So whether it could be games, property, certifications. Um, don't spend too much on your first buy. So if you haven't bought an NFT, don't buy an Azuki NFT, which costs like 10K or 15K, because you don't know what to do with that after that, right? Pick something that's maybe like $20, $30, and then you feel comfortable, see what happens with it. And you can monitor it and you can have fun in the space. Um, so always be um, very safe and read up a bit and always mingle in these communities with the NFT space to learn a bit more. I'm going to jump next to the second question here. Uh, everyone's talking about AI, chat, GPT. Uh, there was a very funny meme video that went on in the Google's town hall. Every single word was mentioned was AI, 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 right? So this the second question is related to that. Will the application of AI in the field of Web3 and NFT give birth to a new digital art form? which will make human artists unemployed. So are we going to kill all the jobs of the artists out there with AI? Okay. Go for it. Okay. Uh, uh, actually, uh, 
Uh, this question uh, reminds me of the, uh, you know, the uh, photography, photography invented in uh, 18th centuries. So I think uh, back to that time, uh, do you believe the, you know, the, the painters, the poetry painters concerned that they may lose their jobs tomorrow? So I think so, you know, I think so. And, and today I think we are facing the uh, same situation, but maybe this time it's a bit more uh, scary. So, the, you know, the AIGC. But to me personally, uh, I don't think the AIGC uh, will um, replace or uh, kill the uh, human artists. So uh, number one, you know, the, uh, our human beings, we uh, process this uh, uh, unique ability to uh, proactively, you know, uh, accept all the, uh, the uh, adapt to the changes and to overcome all the challenges to uh, solve the problems, you know. So uh, we should be confident, you know, we are able to uh, harness the uh, technologies created by us. So even though there are a lot of uh, uncertainties, so besides this, uh, there are also uh, other reasons uh, makes me believe that the AIGC uh, will not replace, you know, the uh, human artists. Okay, uh, the core value of art actually uh, lies in the uh, uh, expression of uh, humans' emotions, humans' culture, and thoughts. So our human artists, you know, they process this uh, unique creativity and, uh, you know, uh, expression ability, which enable them to create more uh, emotionally rich and uh, you know the the artworks you know uh, which the AIGC I don't think can uh, completely uh, replicate and secondly you know the art also has uh, you know many forms of arts uh, you know the sculpture uh, music uh, dance uh, photography you know so maybe AIGC uh, currently has made uh, you know significant progress in certain uh, areas such as you know the processing the image and maybe a uh, uh, music composing but there are still, you know, other areas, you know, the human artists, they still can uh, develop and uh, showcase their talents. For example, uh, uh, dancing, how you see any robots can really dance, you know, as nice as uh, human dancers? I don't think so, you know, I don't think so even in the near term. So that's uh, in conclusion, so I'm, I, I'm pretty confident, you know, in the end, our human artists will coexist with the, you know, all the technologies, just like, you know, the, the history always repeats itself. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Uh, uh, if we say the AI is uh, productivity and uh, Web3 is a production relationship and uh, uh, although AI can learn from the history, the, the civilizations and can fit for everyone's uh, emotion uh, requests, but uh, we still need uh, human, human humanities, and we don't think a pure AI world, a AI-driven world, is a perfect world. Uh, also, take the BTC pandas program as an example. A, uh, each panda is all hand drawn by our uh, young and talented artists, and I think this kind of paintings works can truly uh, makes everyone uh, satisfied in the end. All right, I think, I think AI can create fantastic uh, piece of art, but it's always based on algorithm, analyzing data, existing data. I think AI likes cultural, emotional intelligence totally. I think art is always come from emotion, from strong event, and artists want to express something at some point in time. I think AI probably don't have that ability to think what this event represent, how to represent that event at this moment, and could be any art form. But I think it could help in terms of architecture and management. So I think there's a symbiosis between artists working with AI to create new form of art, but the emotional intelligence will come from the artist at first. I um sorry I <clears throat> right now I do a lot with uh, uh, generative artists, right? So the the form of art that is being shown. You know, in a in a form of coding, is is actually how an artist express themselves, and then it, it forms in a in a kind of a pattern and so forth. I, I think I think that is another form of art, another form of digital asset that you can look at, right? But but maybe adding some spice to the whole panel itself is that I I, I do think that AI would eventually take over many different roles, many many different roles, and and human being like ourselves, we got to work harder. You know, we got to work harder to make sure that we have more value. You know, we, we want to make sure that we can provide more uh, and, and maybe even make the AI more intelligent. 
you know, if we are talking about a DAO, for example, you know, let's not just talk about art. We talk about a DAO, for example. I, I, I had a keynote speech about Web4. You know, it's, it's, just a, it's just a concept where AI would then take over the consensus and give us a, a better output, right? So, so if you look at it from that perspective, and, and, and if you look at it from a long, longer term perspective, this, these are some things that we, we will eventually see, you know, why not accept it right now and see what else we can adapt, you know? So, uh, Sorry, guys. based on, based on people's day-to-day -day jobs, I, I think that I might be the only artist, but feel free to correct me um, on the stage, but day-to-day uh, -day job, I mean, everyone has impressive resumes, but as somebody who works as an artist day-to-day, I'm pretty sure that uh, AI is actually going to completely disrupt people's artistic endeavors and, and, and across all forms. So a good example, I used to work at Pixar, and at Pixar, when I worked there several years ago, we would spend a thousand people to make a film. So it was about $1 million a minute, so 100 minute film, about $100 million. Now with inflation, it probably costs more. Um, so that was a thousand people to make a hundred minute film. I would, I would proffer that today with stable diffusion, with, you know, mid journey, with all the things, with the gen, I, gen AI tools that are coming out of runway ML. Uh, I think that the same films even today, but definitely in a few years could be made with 50 people or less. Um, I think that's astounding, right? And we're seeing that in our industry and in animation, traditional animation. If you're going to have 50 people to make something a thousand people, uh, would have taken to make. I mean, that's the kind of Sh Joseph Schumper like creative destruction is going to be absolutely astounding. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, suffering that's happening now with artists in the artistic industries, and there's going to be even more suffering to come from an uh, employment level. Uh, sorry, guys, I think we have to cut that question. Well, only one thing. I don't agree. I'm artist as well. I'm an award-winning film director in advertising, fashion photographer and TV show. But I went to Web3. I was tired to wait after payment. I decided, oh, if I create my own currency, I pay myself as a great solution. That's one of my entry points. And I felt because I came from the creative industry, I had no problem adopting to the Web3 and the token economy really fast because I had no prior block or education to what financial background. So I think artists are more prone to adopt the Web3 uh, technology and community because we have no block and no previous education towards this new financial uh, technology. Well, I, I, I would disagree that I think you're one of the lucky ones. I think 90% of artists are going to be out of jobs. Like maybe you won't be. Maybe some people will be lucky and you know be people. You yeah, know, guys, and sell their guys, NFT yeah, sorry. For $7 I mean, million. we only got like 10 more minutes. You know, but but uh, I just want to add a quick one. You know, right. last one. Right. <laughs> last one, definitely. Okay. But with AI, everyone is an artist. To be yeah. very honest, you yeah. know, but then no one is. If everyone's an artist, then no one is, right? Yeah. No, but but if you have enough friends and if you have enough good friends with with big wallets, you can be a people too. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to quickly sum that up. So uh, everyone in the panel are very bullish that the artists are going to keep their jobs. Uh, AI is just going to be enabling them, right? I really appreciate it. The next question we have is: How can the NFT financial instrument NFT Fi improve NFT liquidity and pricing efficiency? and accelerate the development of NFT. Um, let me try to simplify the question a bit more, right? Uh, so NFT liquidity is basically when someone is trading NFTs, there needs to be money in the space so that people could buy and sell. There needs to be a market, uh, buy, and de buy and sell a market for this. Uh, what is, what, what is going to, how can we improve the pricing efficiency here like without having too much of volatility and accelerate the development of the space? Um, I, I think it's happening right now. You have platform where you can uh, lend your NFT, you can loan it, your board app, Clonix, Azuki, where you put it there, you borrow a loan so people can lend you money. And what's interesting, it creates liquidity in the market. And secondly, it gives a good, uh, it gives a good valuation of your NFT based on the market demand for the loan. So I think NFT improves liquidity indirectly as long as they have value in the market. Uh, just uh, quickly to add on, so when Eric was uh, mentioning BAYC, Azuki, these are all considered like blue chip NFT projects. To give you a price point, they start at like 10k USD and goes up to like 130k USD on one digital art. Right. Uh, I just want to supply to what Eric was saying. So NFT can also come in a lot of forms where you can look at NFT Fi. It's a way of decentralized protocols for the NFT market. So think about it like um, in the case of NFTs, there's this thing called NFT index, where you can also index the token of the NFT and put in like say top 10 NFT collections in it. So rather than wanting to own 
each NFT from blue chip like Azuki or even like Wall of Women, um, CryptoPunks, you can actually put the whole NFT collections under one token, index token. So this means that you just have to own one single token as an owner. Um, and this is how we can actually create different kind of financial uh, use cases, instrument use cases, in order to create liquidity within the NFT market. Yeah, besides the RWA, real world assets, I think the charm of the NFT is uh, the financial uh, attributes. If we increase the liquidity, uh, as you mentioned, uh, become an alternative invest force by certain users and regulator uh, authorities uh, didn't put a hand on it. Uh, so I, we can take advantage of this. And uh, as NFT China, our platform, I hope to enhance our liquidity through various liquidity solutions. Uh, we aim to be a blue chip exchange and uh, we enable our features like pledging and lending and uh, uh, make our own board ape and uh, crypto punks. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, there's like, what do we call NFTs, right? Is it just something based on the ERC721 protocol or ERC1155? Or is it security token versus utility token, right? I mean, I think it's important to draw that distinction because I think in DeFi right now, there's a lot of utility that is absolutely creating credit, for example, and also uh, enhancing liquidity, right? So a lot of times I go in these spaces and I talk about uh, a lot of finance people are like, oh, you know, you have like 1x leverage, USDC is just, and USDT are just getting dollars in. And there's no credit formation, right? That's what traditional fractional reserve banking does. But if you look at some of these DeFi platforms and you look at some of the things being created there, it's fantastic the kind of credit formation that is happening, right? So trying to do, for example, a reverse cross inverse swap on like a DYDX, which by the way is an American company, but Americans can't use it, which is incredible, right? I mean, it's talk about the state of regulation. I mean, Singapore is much more crypto friendly than America. I'll tell, I'll tell you that for sure. But I think it's really exciting to see the kinds of activities that are happening with tokens in in general, whether you call them security or utility, uh, and it's absolutely enhancing liquidity for all kinds of people around the world. So excited to see where the developments there are going to be. Yeah, actually, uh, just to uh, add on a little bit, because I think uh, every one of us know this. Uh, I mean, the most common method to uh, improve this uh, poor uh, liquidity issue is through these uh, uh, borrowing and lending uh, protocols. But actually, other than this method, there are still other methods in the in the market such as, you know, the fractional uh, NFT, which, you know, you can divide your NFT into many pieces, and you can sell, you know, uh, uh, each piece, you know, individually. So this also can resolve uh, partially the problem. And based on what I know, you know, there are also uh, protocols, they offer these uh, uh, crowdfunding solutions. So it means, you know, the many of us, you can, we just put our share into a, into a pool, and you can, you know, the platform can use this pool to buy an NFT. And if the price goes up, you know, all of us can share the profit based on your share in the pool. Uh, as for the, you know, just now the mentioned the, uh, the poor the price uh, discovery uh, mechanism. So uh, actually, the, you, uh, I know one uh, protocol called the uh, uh, Bank C, uh, Bank C or Oracle. So I think this protocol, they offer these uh, uh, price uh, oracles. It's, uh, it's an NFT evaluation services. So they use their uh, exclusive uh, uh, algorithm and uh, multi-dimensional data analysis. And they will achieve, uh, they will arrive this uh, so-called average uh, price uh, for the NFT they are tracking. So, I mean, there are many protocol, protocols in the market, I mean, the, um, to resolve this liquidity issue as well as the price, uh, you know, the poor price uh, discovery mechanism. My, so my group of uh, researchers, we, we, do, we, we do a lot of uh, different analysis on a different NFT platform, for example, DYDX or Blur. So, so when we look at the liquidity issue right now that you see, I, I think a lot of these liquidity are, are not real to be very honest, because it's just a left hand to the right hand, and there's a lot of watch trading. So, so coming back to the main point of about, about liquidity, you know, I, I still stand by the point that we should draw in more users. You know, if there, there are no users, all these liquidities are only for the whales. You know, if you have 100 EVE, 1000 EVE, yeah, you, you are doing well. You know, you, you rip off all the rewards from the, from the NFT platforms. But this is not something that is sustainable. You know, this is something some, some of these uh, retail investors here should really take note of. Yeah. Uh, 
Sorry, guys, we're running out of time. Um, we're going to wrap up the session and hear a bit more about where to find the speakers for more in-depth questions and answers. So uh, in a nutshell, I think a lot of them shared valuable feedback and insights into what the industry is becoming, what the industry has become. Um, always navigate the space with caution. It is still going, undergoing innovation. As some of the speakers have mentioned, there's still a lot of things that need to be done, especially in the liquidity, uh, liquidity aspect of it. Um, there's still a lot of potential in terms of utility, as mentioned in property, certification, gaming. Pick the best interest of you and read up a bit more about it. Um, speak a bit more to the people over here. I'm going to hand over the mic to the rest of them to tell them a bit more where they could find you guys, right? Where they could find you on social? Uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Well, my name is Hanis Harmalis or follow Reinvent Dow on Twitter as well as on Instagram to know what we do in Reinvent Dow. If you want to be a creator, Come and join us. You can find me through nftchina.hk or follow my LinkedIn. Yeah, I'm really easy. Twitter, just three letters, E-Y-C. So just, yeah, that's it. Eugene, so nice to see you all. For me, it's super easy. You can find me at the booth Jetcoin, B12. And we have two lovely models who do a demo of our technology. They show it our NFT and what we've built and what's new about it. Then you can see current NFT technology versus the dynamic technology we built. Um, with, with my name, I think you can just uh, easily find it. Um, so I'll be on Twitter, LinkedIn, and uh, maybe Andy.com. See you. Yeah, you can follow uh, our uh, platform, Starinaved. You can follow our Twitter account, which is at Starinaved, as, as shown on the screen. You can also follow me through my LinkedIn. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for sharing available insights. Thank you to the audience for listening to us. Have a good time. You can catch me at the booth if you want to speak a bit more. Have fun and catch up soon, right? Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Ganesh. Thank you, uh, the rest of the uh, panelists right here. Because uh, uh, this is the.